Hi, everybody. I'm Brad Rathgaber, the head of school and CEO of One Schoolhouse, and I am joined by today by my friend and colleague, Rafael De Castillo, the executive director of the Rainier Scholars Program. Rafael, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, great to be here. It is, uh, I, I know that this group is just going to really enjoy your insights here on this topic of how academic leaders can create equitable support systems. Um, just a couple of housekeeping uh, notes before we get going here today. First off, uh, as always during these webinars, we use the Q&A function of the Zoom webinar in order to keep track of questions as we go along. Please do not hesitate to put any questions that you have into the Q&A function. In addition, closed captioning is available for this session. Click the closed captioning button in order to enable that um, if that's something helpful for you. A couple other housekeeping notes. On our blog right now, Sarah has written about looking for opportunities to continue to improve student support. And next week, we'll be looking at college counseling insights. On the listserv, uh, if you haven't signed up for the listserv, please make sure to do so. There are some really interesting conversations going up right now on the Academic Leaders listserv, particularly around um, reviewing curriculum. If you don't get our newsletters, make sure to sign up for those. You can do so right on our blog page. And our Pulse question this week was, how has COVID-19 impacted your students' academic and social emotional readiness for this year? These were text answers. And I want to throw these up on the screen. And then, Rafael, I'm going to ask you to comment on some of these. But folks are noted, noting that the range of proficiency, particularly in literary skills, is much wider in the past. And that older students are struggling with time management issues um, now that they have more outside social opportunities. Students who thrive during the pandemic are having difficulty with the transition back to a set schedule as well. Um, another academic leader know that we've had to take a step back and break down long-term projects, more closely discuss SMART goals and strategize and organize with students. Um, on the other hand, some students underwent a tremendous growth in the areas of organization, self-advocacy and motivation. So part of what we're seeing is there's, there's not an evenness to what has uh, to the student experience. Um, students who are new to the school, school are behind, particularly in their regards to their abilities to self-regulate, delay gratification, and control impulsivity. Some have become potentially too dependent on their digital devices, and anxiety is running high. Students have been eager to re-engage in social creatures. In some ways, everything's back to normal. And they're carrying some of the bad dynamics of peer communication during COVID isolation into their face-to-face operations. Uh, we see more pushback when adults directly uh, direct them or hold them accountable. They struggle with fatigue more. Boy, Raphael, that is a lot what we're seeing there and what's going on around the country. I'm, I'm wondering how, how that relates to your experience um, and what you're seeing with your scholars. Yeah, well, first, let me uh, sort of contextualize this. So uh, Rainier Scholars here in Seattle is a college access Organization. So our scholars are identified as particularly promising uh, uh, kids of color and their families supporting them. And they enter the program usually with, a, well, I should say different levels of excitement. Some are more excited than others. But generally, these are precocious kids. They're hardworking, um, academically uh, capable uh, young people. So having said all that, a lot of what you just laid out is coming um, to fruition in our, what we call our academic enrichment phase. And we started that phase in the summer, this past summer was our first live experience in a while uh, at the campus of the Bush School. And some of these young people, in fact, over 90% of them in a poll we did had not been in a classroom, in a physical classroom for 14 months. So imagine those kids who really enjoy that school experience not being in the classroom for 14 months so we found uh, a general excitement to be there and a lot of what you're describing in your list. And, and I will home in on just a couple of things. That, that variation, you know, in terms of literacy and numeracy and fundamentals was absolutely present. Um, mm -hmm. So one might say, well, these are some of the kids that are most successful in school. And even within that population, we saw that broad range of more kids not quite ready to do some of the things we have generally expected them to do. And then I'll home in on one anecdote around anxiety. We have one young man who, who has not been able to return to in-person school. And we have mental health 
support in our organization. We have all sorts of ways to, to wrap around the child and the family, but we have not successfully brought that child back to school. And so that anxiety piece, this being one anecdote, is, is really significant to me and the whole, the whole social emotional well-being of these young people as they navigate this transition. Hmm, that's fascinating. Let's, let's step back uh, one second, Rafael. I'd love for folks to know a little bit about the background that you come to your current position with because um, you've had such an incredible and rich background uh, uh, on which to draw in your, in your new role. Can you just give folks a little bit of the journey that you've been on uh, in school? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll be brief. I'm not going to start you know, as a child born in Cuba, but you can look that up later. Uh, so my career started uh, in the Catholic school system of Miami, um, and I uh, started at a high school there where I was fortunate to bring AP courses to the school, you know, because I had the capacity to teach a couple. So from the beginning, I've been on this road to, to, to you know, helping kids access um, opportunity. Um, I have been absolutely so fortunate to lead two wonderful schools, uh, Seattle Girls School for six years. That's where I first met Brad. And uh, most recently, I was the head of Berchi School here in Seattle, pre-K to five, where, where I got very, very intrigued with early childhood education. I also did two international stints at the American School of Madrid, the National School of Prague. Um, so, and in my um, pre-leadership phase, I taught math and science, every kind of math and science you can imagine. So I have this very broad perspective and I feel like my whole life has been moving toward where the action is, which ultimately I think is early childhood, to be honest. Mm. I moved from high school to middle school to elementary. I'm now very, very interested in, in what happens in ages zero to five. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Maybe we can dive into that a little bit more too here. Um, so let's talk about your current role. Uh, Renier Scholars uh, program works to create a more equitable society by creating access to exceptional opportunities and providing comprehensive support to scholars and their families. Um, my guess is that academic leaders in independent schools really understand the first part of this work. Um, the Rainier Scholars and Like programs help place scholars in their school, but it's the second part that I'd really like to focus in on today, the support needed for these amazing scholars and their families. Why is the support so essential from Rainier Scholars in order for these students to find great success in schools? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a terrific question. And really over time, the organization has discovered the extent of comprehensive support that is needed to be successful, even for these scholars who are academically uh, very precocious, right? So there's that academic enrichment phase that I just talked about, which is meant to level the playing field as best we can in 14 months, because mm -hmm. even with you know, talent and motivation, these kids um, are behind, you know, literally other kids are ahead. They got a head start, if you will, because of their affluence and their circumstances in life. So if we're going to place them into independent schools where there's all this opportunity that kids have had previously, we, ne we need to level that up. But then over time, we have discovered more and more that they need grounding in um, identity work. So we have some courses in that academic enrichment phase called Conclave and then Invictus. And it's all about who are you, um, where do you come from, and diving even deeper into systems of inequality and systems of oppression so that those young people understand what is happening around them as they oh, enter very awesome. affluent spaces. Um, and I would say that that's where the work is right now. And what I'm really excited about is that our independent school partners Having, having been one of them, um, they're very interested in this conversation as well. Like, wh what is it like to be a black or brown kid in our independent schools in this moment uh, in time? And so it's like a mission meeting the moment situation. Um, and, and that's why it's necessary because these spaces weren't built for these children. In fact, in some ways, in many sad situations, they were built uh, to keep these kids out. Yep. So now that they're there, we have to be very attentive to both the academic success they have, but also the, the support they need um, socially and emotionally. Can you talk a little bit more about what you do in those, um, in those identity classes to help really prepare them? I, I think folks are going to be fascinated by this. Yeah. So, um, you know, those classes, first of all, those classes are taught by uh, black and brown teachers. 
te teachers who they can sit in an affinity space with. So uh, Roy Fisher, our mental health therapist, Dr. Heather Clark, who, who teaches uh, cultural anthropology at UW. We, we wanna make sure they are being taught by really, really skilled educators who can create the space for a very difficult conversation for a fifth or sixth grader, right? So number one, it's a lot of scaffolding, 20 years of experience. But then it is about, um, you know, who are you, literally, like, who are you in fifth and sixth grade? Then who are you as a scholar? And then who are you as a community member? And that's the trajectory we follow, but through the lens uh, of equity and inclusion, right? Um, uh, acknowledging that they're about to navigate a space that's very different than what they're used to. And what we've discovered from the scholars themselves is, is that they have moments of tremendous acceptance where they feel heard and seen because the school is doing a particular thing that's wonderful. And then within perhaps the same 24 hours, they have moments of, of invisibility where, where they're not seen or something that is done with often great intention lands on them like a big pile of rocks. And as an example, there was one young man who shared how important it was to have his team rally around him when they visited a team. I won't I won't even call out the geographic area, but it was a horrible situation, you know, that often happens where he was called out by the public and by the other team's members. And that rallying around him and then follow up from the school leadership and from teachers who, who acknowledged that something terrible had happened and wanted to know if he was okay. He speaks of that as like incredible. And then there are other moments where I think even in the classroom, we make we make those classic mistakes of turning to the to the scholar, say, because we're talking about a topic, uh, you know, of interest to us, but of potentially of deep pain for the scholar and their family, and we turn to them as an expert, a voice, you know, a point of instruction. When in fact, the scholar really doesn't want to participate in that in that moment. I can think of a couple of stories like that. Hmm. I it's, it's interesting. I, one of the things that you're pointing to is something that my colleague Sarah wrote about in a blog post this week, and that is, she was talking really about the higher ed level, but I think this is super important for um, independent schools too, and that is colleges are starting to transition from away from the term college ready, i.e. putting that burden on the child, to student ready, putting that burden on the institution. What do you, what do you think of that first, and then let's dive into it for a sec. Yeah, the way I could spend a whole half hour on that one easily. Um, you know, I'll throw in uh, an initiative we have going that's interesting. So uh, we are starting our first cohort in Tacoma. Tacoma is a city south of Seattle, very different than Seattle. And we're starting the summer of 2022, but there is not a rich independent school culture there. There are only two independent schools, maybe three, depending on how you look at it. So we had to reinvent the model a little bit and it's going to be uh, embedded in the public schools uh, and Tacoma mm -hmm. public schools are very excited about enriched learning for all students. So then it becomes a question of who are the students in front of you? What do they need, right? And how can the institution they're working with right now and future institutions meet them where they are and take them where they need to go? Yes. And so Tacoma has sort of flipped the concept of being ready for independent schools, and frankly, in some cases, stealing the students for independent yeah. schools, right? These things are going to happen to you, which is not a pleasant thing to do, but I would say we are obligated to do it uh, while seeking to influence the independent school world. So I think being kid ready is what this conversation that I'm talking about, it, it's what is at the heart of it, and it's what makes it exciting. Like we are acknowledging and, re and recognizing that it's not on the kid who is 10, by the way, Right. To be ready for us, both in terms of impact in the social emotional realm and uh, academically ready because, gosh, we, we have institutionally not given them all they need. So I think it puts the burden on us to, to rethink things. And look, um, my view, having gone through uh, two independent schools, is that the equity and inclusion conversation is helpful for everyone. Right. If, if, we, if we think about these questions for black and brown students, we're actually helping all students learn better in a more differentiated way, in a safer way. It, it, like we all gain with this. I'm 
probably preaching to the choir here, but I think that's an important thing to circle back to. We're not doing this for these students. These students are giving us an opportunity. And, and we're treating each kid as an individual, right? Yes. It, it's, 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 it's beyond differentiation to personalization. It's, it's understanding that different kids are in different spaces. Ab absolutely. I mean, and you know, the, the, the organization you've led for a while and our Tacoma leaders are talking about individualized learning, whether it's yeah. online or not. It's this notion of each, you know, I'm sure we're very, very close to this notion of we all have learning differences <laughs> and we all actually deserve as individualized a path as possible, um, which is the, ultimately the course we take as we become adults. So uh, before we get dive into this even further, because I think Raphael and I could talk about this for, for hours on end here, folks, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to put them into the Q&A feature. I'll make sure that, um, that we get them get them in here. Raphael, are there things that you've learned in your first number of months working as an executive director at Rainier that you think, oh gosh, I wish I knew that when I was working at Virtue or Seattle Girls? Huh, that's, that's a great question. Um, it's so hard because <laughs> I, 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 Rainier Scholars has been a part of my life for a while, right? So I've got to un, unhook these these things. Uh, my, my first experience with Rainier Scholars was as a teacher a thousand years ago. I was teaching math at Seattle Girls School. And I think this was cohort one or two of Rainier Scholars. And we had a, a large contingent from that cohort. And they came into my class. And I'll never forget, they walked in. And, and I'm not really exaggerating much. They said, you teach algebra wrong. And, and of course, they, they were used to that boot camp environment. And I was yes. a more constructive approach. But just to have a group of young women in, in this case come in and say, hey, we need to talk because we're not we're not grooving on your way of teaching. I thought that was so incredible. And from that point on, I really started paying attention um, to this organization. I guess that leads to this notion of we we don't teach in a vacuum, right? I, yeah. I think often we are so, I'll just speak for myself. In my career, there were moments where I was thought where where I thought, okay, I have this chemistry class and this is the only world that exists for me and that exists for these students. I'm not even sure I really was in tune some of my fellow teachers in that high school, you know, period one to period eight type of thing. But beyond that, there are so many potential partnerships. I mean, Rainier Scholars being one of them that can help the child and the family within that school context. So classroom, school, and then community. And, and you know, quick plug that that's the whole early childhood Reggio inspired approach of the community or the village saying, we're all going to teach these children from zero to whatever. Um, and so I think that's what moving into Rainier Scholars has really reinforces. Teachers should not be, and particularly now, teachers should not be alone in this. We, we should be conveying uh, a broader um, network of support for teachers in the classroom. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting, Rafael, because the, the, our theme over November and December that we're talking about at One Schoolhouse is, is education is a team sport, that we all have to work together in, in this, and that there's a place that the admissions office has to plug into, there's a place that college counselors are going to have to plug into, counseling services at school, working with parents, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and you're really speaking to that too. Um, Emily has asked us a question. She says, this sounds like a move towards universal design for learning, UDL. And how can teachers be supported in that work? Yeah, that's, a, that's so, I'm smiling because that is also a term we are throwing around in Tacoma. Um, and, um, you know, you're, like this is being taped, right? So other people will hear this. <laughs> we, we may have to tear some things down, I think, mm. in order to support teachers in that sort of thinking, you know? And I mean, a lot of the, you know, the fundamental structures of independent schools, public schools. And if, if not now, I mean, if not after this COVID thing, when, when would we start um, dismantling some things that just don't work? If they ever work, they certainly don't work now. And I think there's also an opportunity. There are things that are successful remotely and online. I, again, I'm not getting like a little honorarium for saying that. You're preaching it, the choir on that one, you know it. <laughs> it is absolutely uh, 
proven after two years yeah. of this, we have noted both at Berti School, certainly in our Rainier Scholars, that there are moments where this makes more sense. And just as a quick example, we have typically asked families to come for Saturday school during mm. that 14 month period and Wednesday evening school. Well, we are now moving, we have now moved to remote Wednesdays and not only are they working, they're a keeper. There's no reason <laughs> to both sacrifice your Saturday, which is a whole other question, and sacrifice really all of Wednesday, you know, in terms of transportation and whatnot. So those remote opportunities on Wednesday are working beautifully, you know, and it's the sophistication of the platform that will be helpful and things of that sort. So, yeah, I mean, I know that's a very glib, quick answer, but we, we've got to be willing to tear some things down uh, in terms of scheduling um, and um, even the buildings we inhabit for, for certain periods of time during the day. Yeah, I, and and Rafi, I won't surprise you that UDL is one of those things that we're looking at quite a lot these days too and trying to figure out how to uptrain teachers um, in different areas. And, and a lot of it starts with just meeting teachers with where they are in their own understandings and helping them see that there are strategies out there that can do exactly what all of us want to do, which is just help reach kids better and where they are. Yeah. Well, and we just proved that teachers can learn really fast. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I know that's, it was not under ideal circumstances, but I have talked to more than one teacher who, who has said, wow, you know, despite the tragedy of it all, I learned like 10 things that I didn't think I could learn in a short period of time. So let's, let's dive into, are, are there other ways that uh, COVID-19 has has changed the thinking for Rainier Scholars and changed the types of supports that you want to be offering in the future. And so what are some of those other kind of keepers on your list and changes that you made? Yeah, well, I, I just talked about that remote Wednesday. Um, That's a big one. For an organization like Rainier Scholars, we realize that the level of support is, that is needed is sometimes a little heartbreaking and, and we're in a position to do that. So during parts of the COVID pandemic, uh, before I arrived as ED, it was about providing food yeah. on a regular basis to some of our families. Um, uh, tragically, providing funeral expenses for one family. Um, so on the one hand, it's this realization that coming to the education table is so difficult for some of our kids, right? Particularly black and brown kids. Like we sometimes forget the level of challenge, you know, fundamental challenge, food on the table, transportation, paying the rent, that sort of thing. So I think for Rainier Scholars, it just reinforced, right, you know, like we have to be there all along the 12 year journey, not just the 14 months. Um, and then I think, you know, when I weave it together with Berchi, it is this sense of, you know, we could wait for this to happen to us, go kicking and screaming. <laughs> Like I, I've, I've talked to some colleagues where they're like, well, we just have to remain strong and let, and let people know that we cannot offer some of these remote options. It's just not going to happen. And I don't think that's a winning strategy <laughs> because um, in fact, we will offer it, right? We will offer it to families who have unique circumstances around their health, around their well-being, a variety of reasons. And once you offer it, you do have the question, well, why can't we find a structure? Again, tearing some things down where we can be more individualized with, with our kids. Let's, let's settle there for a second because that's a place I've been super surprised by too. I've been surprised that schools are not, not offering virtual options for students, whether it's with their own teachers or not with their own teachers too, right? Like there's structures in there that, that started to crumble during COVID but haven't been totally torn down and it's leaving opportunities for both good and bad actors to step into that space. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I think it's, um, look, it's, it's also exhaustion, right? I mean, folks have such a desperate desire to go back to normal, whatever that normal is. And at some point we're gonna have to pause and go, was normal really okay? Um, and maybe we just need a minute to catch up there, but independent schools in particular, right? who have a business model that we have been recognizing as fundamentally flawed, right? Like five to 10% tuition forever is at some point going to be problematic, if not already. 
Um, so why not open this up, right? And, and I think part of the challenge will be, maybe you all have discovered the same thing, that we tried to hybridize this in a way that may have been a little lose-lose, <laughs> yes. right? Yes. So rather than think of it as, oh, those hybrid days were so hard, they were so unhelpful to children and to adults. But what if, what if we offered a menu yes. of in-person uh, experiences and some remote experiences and not necessarily tied together where, you know, we're all in the same room together because we're not, you know, I, I was at this heads conference and I noticed a colleague who had been remote the whole time. <laughs> and I just saw his little box, you know, with his name. And I thought, well, that's not working. <laughs> Um, so, so I think getting past the need to hybridize and start thinking more creatively about parallel paths and even schools within school. Yeah. And, and centering equity in that conversation is, is the opportunity that we all want, right? Oh my gosh. It's, there are so many families, uh, black and brown families in particular, who love the remote option for a variety of very complex reasons. And, and if we don't pay attention to that, we're, we're really losing an opportunity. Absolutely. Uh, so let's, let's shift gears for the final couple of minutes here and talk about if that was some of the impact that COVID has had, what are some of the additional layers um, of impact of a, of a nation, nationwide racial reckoning that have also changed some of the thinking um, in the Seattle area broadly and, and with Renier Scholars? Yeah, no, the, the reckoning is real for all of us, right? So in some cases, Rainier Scholars is advocating for a family or a scholar who has engaged with an organization with great intention, who has landed something on the child, right? Um, certainly, I can think of one incident where, you know, we recommended a, a summer opportunity and young people are mimicking the behavior of of adults. And so, you know, this, this young man visited this horrific epithet on, on, on our scholar. And we had this whole conversation around um, advocacy on our part, right? Bringing the parents to the institution. The institution is good intention, but really failed in the moment. But then I think the tricky part is not to not get too, too high and mighty about where you are, because then we have to turn the lens on ourselves. Some folks would, would, would um, ask us to answer some questions around, you know, taking these students from public schooling into independent schooling. And some of these are the most capable students. And we know the journey will be hard. Are we doing all we can to make that better? So I think reckoning is just this reciprocal conversation of, hey, that, that's, if that was ever okay, because we just sort of let it go, it certainly is not okay anymore. And so stepping up as an advocate when it is called for, but also being self-reflective. Um, so we, we presented at NWIS, the fall conference, and we started with self-reflection. Let us share with you all classroom teachers what we have learned as an institution, Rainier Scholars, from our scholars who come back to talk to us. And we're gonna share some of that. And then we hope that plants a seed of further self-reflection you know, on, on the other part. But it's, it's very reciprocal, I think, being preachy and being, um, and calling people out just sort of pushes them away from the conversation. Well, Raphael, we promise everybody that these are only 30 minute webinars, but I think we could probably go on for another couple hours. We'll likely invite you back here soon to share our continued thoughts and to hear more about the journey that you're making. Well, thank you for the invite, Brad, I appreciate it. And thank you everybody for attending. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Good day, folks.